to City Life. Coming up today, the Canterbury Youth Development Programme. We speak with a child expert, a singer who has written an anthem for New Zealand, and Warren Feeney on what's happening with the arts in Christchurch this week. For first on the programme, it, last week was Men's Health Week, and Martin is here to talk about it. What was the focus the, um, the last week on Men's Health? Well, um, International Men's, the International Week of Men's Health is just a ra it's raising the awareness. I mean, I think the long-term men have been felt not to be that good at uh, taking care of themselves. And mm. so this uh, it came about 10 years ago, I think, the international um, idea. And, and it was really about promoting men's health and wider awareness. So here in New Zealand, that was what the week is about. And from the Cancer Society's perspective, it's a, it's a key, key message for us. What was the focus on last week's Men's Health Week? I think the main focus was about being aware of your own body, being aware that, that it's not... Um, it's not wrong to, to, to be concerned about yourself. Mm. We're not encouraging people to just run off to the doctor, but obviously in terms of um, just taking a check. Mm. Um, you know, it's from, from men's perspective, it's really like about sort of thinking, you know, let, let, have I had a good check over? Have I actually been to the doc over the last couple of years? Mm. Um, is it worth it? And as we get older, you know, particularly if we get to about 50, it's worth going and, and just getting a, a full check over. It's, mm. it's a bit like having a warrant of fitness, really. Mm. So it's, it's and, and that's, that's the kind of message that, that's coming out from Men's Health Week. Okay. It, it's about that language, you know, getting a check up, getting a woof. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I and mean, because we take our cars to get a warrant of fitness don't we we should take ourselves well that's right and I think one of the interesting things is that over the years that they've looked at what kind of language works for men and one of the things that the Cancer Society is uh, is working on is is a, is a toolkit mm. um, and it's very much framed around you know blokes and, and, and sheds and um, on, on the line to get get the toolkit uh, from the Cancer Society is about literally it looks like a toolkit you open it up mm. and you look at the blood pressure you look at the the bottle for the sunscreen mm. you, you know you look at the healthy eating and I think that's really attractive because it isn't it isn't couched in negative oh you know we're going to die we're going to do this we're going to do that it is about look after yourself mm. but men's health week is an opportunity to look at look at those messages and the Cancer Society is keen that those messages actually really do appeal to blokes what sort of things should men be looking um, looking for well I think the the overall thing is that there are some there are lots of things that we can do so first thing is you know How's your body weight? You know, should you know? Are you taking enough exercise? Mm. Do you smoke? Um, perhaps do you think you might drink a little bit too much? Those are the kind of things, and that that really in a checklist you might want to ask yourself. And if you've got any concerns, go and talk to your health professional. That's that's the most important thing. If you've got any any doubts, and I think again the evidence is men don't tend to talk. Mm. You know, they might talk talk around. You know, talk to each other, which is great. Mm. But sometimes if you, you want some health advice, you really should go and see the health professional. Mm. As I say, we're not encouraging everybody to run off with every twinge, but it's like if you've got something that's been, you know, bothering you for you know, a couple of weeks and you think, well, actually, there's nothing wrong with talking about it. Mm. And I think that's where people say, you know, maybe women, you know, do talk about, about you know, their, their personal you know, mm. medical conditions, whereas uh, the conception is blokes, you know, talking about that kind of thing mm. there's nothing wrong with it mm. and don't google your symptoms right oh no no <laughs> i mean I, google is a fantastic tool but in some respects you know you could google anything mm. and you know you could you can imagine you've got it in 30 mm. minutes so a little information is is in the wrong hands is not good so really get the right information talk to your health professionals Tell me about what we were talking about before about the main focus with the Cancer Society at the moment. Well, I think the Cancer Society, uh, obviously it's got a long tradition of SunSmart messages. Mm. And within men's health, um, clearly, you know, without being sexist, there are a lot of outdoor workers who are men. And so early in the piece, the Cancer Society recognised that outdoor workers was a very, it was a very good um, example of where we can get a healthy message out. So taking some protection for outdoor workers is a key men's health message. Mm. So for the Cancer Society, one of the messages that we've been developing over the years and one that I think we've got a good recognition for is sun protection. So it was logical that we actually developed an outdoor workers message mm. for all the roadies and builders out there through Canterbury and, and, and obviously that's a really important message as, mm. we, as, we, as we look ahead into the summer.
Well, it's not just a summer thing, too, is it? I mean, no, raisin... uh, no. I mean, okay. the thing is, we might say the sun protection message is seasonal, mm. um, but obviously, it's important to to notice any changes in your skin. And it was about what I was talking about earlier in mm. terms of you know knowing changes in your body. You know, if you, if you notice some some little change in a mole or something on your skin, go and get it checked out. Mm. So that's one of the things that the evidence said. You know, maybe men aren't good at at, at acting. On, on their instincts and things. So go and get it checked out. Okay. Right, finally, your key message to the men in Canterbury is? Just look after your bodies. Don't be ashamed to talk about it. Talk to your partner, you know. But if you really think about going, you know, you've got something that's been nagging you for a few weeks, go and talk to the health professional. There's nothing wrong with actually worrying about your own body. Mm. Ten to one, it'll be fine. But the important thing is talk about it. Don't keep it to yourself. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thanks for coming on City Life. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome Mike, who's part of the Canterbury Youth Development Program, to the program. Now tell me about Canterbury Youth Development. Thanks, Kenita. Um, well, uh, Blue Light Canterbury Youth Development Program started five or six years ago. There's a group of Canterbury businessmen and uh, members of the community, the army, the police all got together uh, to try and uh, come up with some sort of solution to really tackle the issue of youth crime in Christchurch. So they started putting it all together and then we started operating about three or four years ago now. So tell me about the things that you do in this program. Well, the young people that we primarily target are those uh, working at, uh, offending at the high end of, of the spectrum, if you like. Um, so grievous bodily harm, aggravated robbery, um, long histories of burglaries and what have you. We find that most of the young people who come through the court system, because they get referred to us by child, youth and family, the police and the court system, uh, they've had a, an absolutely horrific upbringing. So the young people that you frequently hear about from child, youth and family, gone through years of abuse and, and all the rest of it growing up and they've sort of ended up in this, this level of crime, if you like. So that's the families that we work with and the young people. Uh, we run them through the army. So three times a year we have our young people go through the army for, for a couple of weeks at a time. The army do a fantastic job. It's not a boot camp, I like to point out. Mm. Uh, although the army can be pretty tough on them. Mm. And what the army do is they get them to a stage where they're ready and receptive for the sorts of messages that we can then feed them. Mm. Uh, so after they come out of the army they graduate there and then we have uh, our psychologists and our social workers, our teachers, youth workers, the whole team. There's 15 of us who work together uh, pretty closely. And we... Uh, as I say, work intensively with them to try and get them to, to change their behaviours and modify their behaviours. Mm. Some of them pick it up very quickly, some of them can take months, and then we find work for them and we support them in work. Wow. How's it working? Really, really well, actually. Yeah. Very, very well. Um, you're not going to save all the young people. Um, and at the end of the day, we can only present them with opportunities and they've got to make the decision to, to do that. Mm. Uh, but we support them through it uh, and actually we get some fantastic results. Um, we're told by child youth and family and, and international literature that if you can achieve a, a 30 per cent non-reoffending rate with this group of young people then you're running a, a world-class program. We consistently achieve 65 to 70 per cent um, all the way through. So yeah, it's pretty intense, it's pretty stressful, long hours for everybody, uh, but the staff are just a, a, a fantastic group of people, um, absolutely committed to working with the young people and their families. So. Yeah, it's good fun, mm. um, incredibly hard work, often stressful, um, but hugely rewarding, absolutely rewarding. How do you measure the success of the program? Well, the, the, the most basic measure is their offending rate, mm. uh, so whether they are still offending and also the level of offending. So you might have a young person who has committed a series of aggravated robberies, for example, um, who might be shoplifting now. So they're still offending, but the level of offending has, has dropped quite a bit. So whether they're still offending, the levels of offending, and then the, the more difficult things, to, to get them into work or training and keep them there. Mm. So we measure that as well. Okay. Um, and we do a whole range of other assessments. Social workers and psychologists do self-esteem and, and sort of self-efficacy type assessments as well. Mm. How did you come up with the, um, the, the processes like the um, send them to boot camp and get some help? How did you come up with those ideas for that sort of, I guess, formula? Um, well, I just want to add, it's not a boot camp, but uh, we, yeah. we, this is prior to my time, we um, got some, uh, a, a researcher based in the North Island, um, a woman called Kay McLaren. She designed the basic um, 
formula, if you like. It's not uh, unusual though, that formula is, is actually quite widely known anyway, mm -hmm. so do some intensive work with them, maybe take them into the bush, do some work with young people, get their attention, get them um, thinking about who they are, a bit mm -hmm. of self-awareness going on, and then work intensively with them and then support them in the community. That's, that model was actually tried and tested and, and well known. But we engaged a woman called Kay McLaren who, who um, came up with the research, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and put us through that. Uh, and so we devised the model from there. We got an evaluation last year, a company, um, an accountancy firm here in Christchurch, BDO, uh, did an evaluation and demonstrated that in our very first year alone, which was 2000, half 2007 and 2008, we saved Canterbury, if you like, um, over a million dollars just in that very first year alone. And of course that figure is cumulative, so every year it's another, it's sort of two million, three million, four million as, mm. as you get more cohorts of young people going through. Okay. So that was based on figures that Treasury provided us right. in terms of the cost of crime for young people and victims and, okay. and the court system and what have you. And are you just working with the young people or are you working with their siblings and their families as well? You have to work with a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, you can't really take a young person out of isolation, you know, like a, a garage, if you like, fix them and then send them back in. You've got to try and work with their families as much as possible. Um, of course, families are not ordered by the courts to work with us, so that's where I guess our, the strength and skill of our social workers comes into play. Mm. They've got to convince the families that um, working with us is a good thing. Okay. The young people have to, um, but the families don't always have to. Um, so it's a matter of convincing the families um, you know, in a, of a particular direction. But I guess we've got a, a belief that all families and all parents actually want what's best for the young people. Um, so establishing trust and rapport with families is absolutely crucial. Okay. What about how um, the young people have been affected by the earthquakes? Well, they've been hugely affected, obviously, um, particularly after February. Uh, we lost several in the sense that they went up to the North Island or some went down south. Um, so the number of young people that we were working with dropped quite dramatically for a very short time. They've all come back and we're all still working with them. Th there is a, a silver lining to the cloud um, in the sense that now in Christchurch, as I'm sure you're aware, there's lots of opportunities for fit, strong young men who are willing to work uh, to get employment. Mm. So we've got a whole range of, of young people now working in, in reconstruction, if you like. Um, so it's provided opportunities as well. Um, but immediately after the earthquake, our team swung into action. We had all of our staff members going out visiting the young people and their families uh, because looting was just so easy, very easy. Uh, we had one young person who got involved in that. Um, we managed to keep all of the other young people that we're working with away from that. But that was a huge amount of effort on, part of, on, on the part of our staff members to, to do that. So it's one young person out of how many? Um, probably 40, 40 to 50, wow. and these are the high tariff youth offenders as well, or young people with a, a, a really high offending history. So what does that show you? Oh, it shows us that it's working really. It also shows the staff commitment, um, their ability or their willingness to work outside of ours and, and, and do what it takes really, whatever it takes. Okay, to, and finally, to... what's, what's coming up next? Uh, well, this year is an interesting year for us. Obviously, we've had all of the earthquakes and we've had relocation. Um, we have implemented a new program which we've called Refocus for young people in school, which is year 9 and 10 level, who are just starting out in, a, in an offending career, if you like, mm -hmm. so to try and turn them back into, um, or refocus them back onto track. Uh, we've started up a program which follows a 100% kaupapa Māori framework, so it's total immersion in reo and, and whakapapa and mātauranga, a whole range of um, mauraako, kapahaka, um, living on a marae. So pretty excited about that. Mm. And then the other one is our new work scheme, which we call Mahi Tahi, which we're in partnership with another community organisation called Te Ora Hau, um, and that's where our young people go into work. So really it's consolidating those um, three new programmes and um, making sure that the team work in a cohesive fashion because we're all spread across different sites because you know we lost our building, uh, we've got people working from home, uh, so it's very hard to actually work as a team when you've got everybody all over the place. So that's kind of the focus for this year is to get ourselves back on track, um, consolidate the three new programmes and um, yeah, continue our momentum. Oh well, good luck. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming on the programme. Thanks very much. We'll be back after this break. Welcome Norm Dews to City Life. Now t tell me about earthquake navigators. Their, um, their responsibility is to um, visit the homes, identify the problems, assist immediately where they can, and if not, uh, provide the right direction and information on how they can fix their problems. 
Okay, and whose initiative was this? Oh, it was an initiative between the community. Uh, in, in respect to Crown agencies, it was the, it's heavily sponsored by the Ministry of Social Development and Te Puni Kōkiri. Okay, and so what, when did this start up? It started up in the uh, September earthquake and um, following on with the 22nd of February earthquake, uh, we'd actually hit the road running. Uh, we thought the 22nd of February, we thought the September earthquake, uh, that was it. Um, it wasn't to be, obviously. So um, we were very familiar with the scene and what we had to do and uh, we were able to iron out uh, any imperfections there were in our processes mm. uh, to assist the community and to work uh, much more collaboratively with the whole range of Crown agencies, including the New Zealand Police and the New Zealand Fire Service. Mm, okay. Now let's look at the, um, the let's look at in, at in detail the services that you've been offering. Oh, from um, taking people to the hospital, to um, tidying up their backyards, uh, to removing rubble, uh, to organising the. Um, uh, toilet facilities to be adequately provided to household owners, many more. Okay, and did you find that there was a real need for this? There was a need and it's a growing need, there still is. Let's talk about the needs that are still there. Well, a lot of the needs is um, people are becoming quite insecure in their homes, many, many are. They're, um, they've made um, makeshift fences uh, they've even got themselves uh, some animals to protect themselves. One of the difficulties that the navigators have is when they go visiting, uh, there's dogs on the properties, uh, they can't get in. Our concern is that if there is a, an accident or a, an injury to the householder, uh, no one knows until it's too late. So have you, have you got any examples of this? Oh, there's some examples. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that our navigators can provide you with some much better examples of what I'm able to do here today. Okay. But that, that's a common occurrence for them. Okay. Let's look at um, who your navigators are. They're people with a friendly disposition. That's, that's, uh, that's the main qualification required. They need to be community friendly. They need to be community smart. They need to be, um, to know the, know the streets. More importantly, they need to, to know how to talk to, to the families to ensure uh, that they bring some comfort and some, um, some safety to them okay. when, they, when they visit it. So, you know, there are um, some 30 to 40 navigators in town, of which 10 are, um, are engaged by uh, the Servant Authority. Um, and of the 32, since, um, since March, um, we've visited over uh, between three and four thousand homes. We've fielded um, over five thousand eight hundred phone calls, and of those phone calls, twelve hundred were um, were serious, and the navigators were able to successfully uh, assist those families with them. Okay, let's look at some of your short-term goals with the navigators. Well, it's mainly working collaboratively with the Crown agencies. That's, that, that's, that's got to be the biggest opportunity that's, that's available right now. Mm. One of the, um, I guess one of the, the good things, if there is a good thing from this earthquake that's, that's come out of it, is that the closer collaboration between Crown agencies themselves mm. and to work collaboratively with all community providers who are wanting to provide um, help uh, to rebuild a city. And your long-term strategy? The long-term strategy, um, I guess that's anybody's guess. The, um, we're, we're not too sure how long it will take um, the powers to come up with a, um, with, with a strategy so that we can work collaboratively with them. This is Sarah. Um, um, we're hoping that the, uh, the new CEO who starts today uh, will bring some some movement right now it feels as though the community seems to think that the uh, uh, the response from from the city has been a little bit slow to those who are requiring services uh, however we're hoping that with the new ceo coming on board he'll be positive and he'll make things happen um, 
there'll be there'll be some um, some hiccups along the way, but I'm sure that um, that Sarah will be doing their best for the city. Okay. And how can people get in touch with the navigators if they are wanting a visit from them? Well, you can phone the, uh, the there is an 0800 number, or um, I, I don't have that 0800 number with me right now. But there is an 0800 number, or they can phone the Ngahari Far National Marae and just ask to speak to the lead navigator there. Okay. And um, as soon as that happens, the, the response is fairly rapid. City Life and I'd like to welcome to the program Dr Ian Lockhead from the University of Canterbury. Now you're here to talk about heritage buildings. How are our heritage buildings in Christchurch? Well our heritage buildings are in pretty bad shape. Uh, I think they came through the September earthquake remarkably well but a lot of those buildings were weakened and February 22nd, well Boxing Day before that and then February 22nd were, were just more than many of them could cope with and the provincial council buildings for example survived those first two earthquakes but it was damaged and February 22nd was just too much and mm. then the 13th of June has done significantly more damage uh, to many of those buildings as well. Was it surprising that they, they crumbled like that or crumbled like that? Well yes and no. Uh, buildings that had been strengthened, buildings like the old government buildings, now the heritage apartments came through all the quakes remarkably well. But the provincial council buildings, for example, really difficult to strengthen that building in a way that wasn't going to impact negatively on their heritage values. And we always knew that in a really severe earthquake that building would have problems, mm -hmm. even though it had had strengthening. Wow. Um, just looking at Christchurch, it's well known as a city with beautiful buildings or it has been well known mm. for that. What's the future of Christchurch now in terms of heritage buildings? Well, I think we will recognise that the heritage buildings that we have left will be just that much more important. And I think Napier is an instructive example because they've got a handful of buildings that survived the 1931 earthquake and they are seen as really key buildings. And I think we're going to have a huge revaluation of our heritage. Buildings that perhaps we didn't think of as quite so important before will take on a much greater significance in the post-earthquake city. Mm. So there will still be heritage buildings in Christchurch, but we'll think about them in different ways and we'll, I think we'll value them just that much more. Mm. How important is it for us to retain some heritage buildings here? Well, I think it's absolutely crucial for the future of the city because they do provide that essential link with our past. Mm. And the heritage buildings that uh, have been damaged, many of those uh, will come down. But I think it's really important that, particularly for key buildings, that, like the two cathedrals, that we do absolutely everything we can to try and retain those because mm. they're very much the identity of the city. They're, they're buildings that I think people, they knew they were there before their lifetimes and I think we all expected they would be there well after our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So they, they provide that connection between the past, the present and the future. Mm. It's like great trees that we know have a lifespan much greater than human beings. Mm. So they're really important in that sense. Which are the ones that we should keep hold of? Well, I've mentioned the two cathedrals. I think they're absolutely critical. Um, the provincial council buildings, the council chamber has been really badly damaged. Mm. But it, it is recoverable. It could be reconstructed if there's the will and the commitment and the time. And I think time is a really crucial mm. ingredient. We shouldn't be rushing into decisions that will that will really make it impossible mm. for us to do things like reconstruction in the past, mm. uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, areas like High Street, where there's a high concentration of buildings, really don't know how badly the, uh, the June earthquake has impacted on those. But before 
the 13th of June. That was certainly looking like a precinct that could be recovered. So anywhere where there are groupings of buildings, I think it's really critical that we should try and keep as many as possible and to infill in appropriate scale, in appropriate materials, to try and retain those special areas. Are you part of any group that is wanting to keep these buildings? Well, I've been involved with a number of groups. Iconic, which was set up um, after September to, or to try and uh, bring together uh, heritage advocates, building owners, property owners, um, everybody with an interest in the central city. And that group has been working incredibly effectively in terms of um, lobbying, uh, first of all, civil defence, um, and we will be lobbying Sarah in terms of not making hasty decisions in terms of mm. heritage buildings, indeed any buildings in the central city, because if we have to start from an absolute blank sheet of paper, it's going to be much harder than being able to repair and then strengthen existing buildings. It'll get things moving again mm. much quicker. Okay. And finally, what's the most important thing to do with our heritage, heritage buildings at the moment in Christchurch? Well, I think to recognise the value it has for the city mm -hmm. and to take enormous care with the buildings that uh, may well be in a very fragile state, but mm -hmm. anything that's recoverable, I think we should be doing everything we possibly can to ensure those buildings survive. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the programme. Thank you. We'll be back after this break. We're back with City Life and I'd like to welcome to the programme musicians Amy Bowie and Joshua Goodyear. Good to have you here. Thanks for having us. Kenny. Now Amy, you have written an anthem. Tell me about this. Yes, I have written an anthem for the um, songwriting competition called Anthem in Black um, and it's made the CD. It's called um, The Emotion and the CD is uh, for the New Zealand Olympics Committee. Really? Yes. <laughs> so the New Zealand Olympics Committee were looking for the soundtrack of a nation. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so my duet, which I recorded with Joshua, has made the grade. That's awesome. Yeah. So any other Christchurch musicians on there? Um, yes, there is. Um, Rosanna Gamlin Green, and uh, her song is called Turn to Gold. Okay. And uh, yeah, so hers is brilliant as well. Cool, yeah. tell me about your song. Um, my song I wrote uh, as a duet to honour both the men and the women of the Olympic mm -hmm. team, the mm -hmm. Kiwi Olympic team. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and so I envisaged it with a, a male singer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did, you, how did you meet each other? How do you know each other? Well, we uh, met at Christmas in the Park last year. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you were both singing there? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we met from there and then... Yeah. Did you audition him? Uh, <laughs> no, well, actually, um, our producer, Richard Merritt, sort of re-suggested him to me. I said, oh, who do you think, who do you think? And, and Richard said, oh, Joshua, I think Joshua's cool. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Cool. So your song is one of the um, songs on the anthem in black. What happens now with it? Can it be chosen to be the anthem? Uh, yes. Basically, they're going to hold uh, another stage of the competition so they're releasing a second CD for next year I think the competition opens in September for that mm -hmm. and um, then they will choose out of both CDs the official anthem of the games wow. so um, our next yeah. step really is to apply for um, the new New Zealand on Air making tracks funding mm -hmm. um, to see if we can get um, our song to sound as um, brilliant and fat as the um, <laughs> fat pH fat oh. pH fat <laughs> right. um, as the first track on the album which actually had um, I believe five thousand dollars worth of New Zealand on Air funding um, a few years ago mm -hmm. and then just happened to end up on the CD so wow. um, yeah so we'd love it to sound just as good as that yeah. with maybe a choir yeah. and a full band and yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah how exciting yeah so tell me about the recording process because I know there's a bit of story there <gasps> yeah, well, it was a bit weird at first but um well because you know uh, when the earthquake hit it was like all the studios were closed in town so you know um, Amy here was really 
you know, stressing to, to find a, you know, studio. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we found a studio, uh, one of our friends, like, in, in his house. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Mr. basically, Maris, was it? Yeah, yeah, I basically emailed Richard and I said, oh, no, I can't find any studios in Christchurch. There's none, mm. none open. Mm. And um, do you know of anywhere that has a grand piano? And so um, I sent him the track and he, he sort of emailed back and said, I'm quite happy to produce for you so wow. I was really honoured yeah. and um, yeah and so then we got in touch with Michael Bell and he ended up borrowing gear because his studio, um, Orange Studio, is in the red zone mm. and he couldn't get into it at that stage mm. and then we ended up at Clayton and Lucy Hiku's house recording mm. the vocals and at Richard's house recording the piano fighting. Great birds tweeting and, yeah. and, and having to sing extra quiet the guide vocal because we're in an adjacent room mm. so yeah, yeah it was oh. really quite really a strange process so yeah. yeah it'd be really nice to do it properly with some New Zealand on air funding so. yeah. <laughs> all right yeah. yeah let's hope you get the funding <laughs> yeah. now Joshua you've got a bit of a, an exciting story at the moment tell me what you're up to yes well um I just got uh, into the top 16 uh, for this boy band that's going to be uh, launched by Universal Records and the audition is this Thursday in Auckland so I'm going to go fly up there. I was meant to be um, last Thursday but it got cancelled by the volcanic ash so um, yeah I'm wow. just pretty excited about that. That's really yeah. exciting. So what will happen if you get into that band? Uh, well uh, the uh, 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 Paul Walker is the one that's organising this talent search. Mm. He said in August um, that they're trying to release um, a few songs, get a few songs recorded uh, and also um, make some music videos and also another big opportunity will be to perform at uh, the Rugby World Cup. Oh. So, wow. Yeah. So I'm so rooting for yeah. Josh. Oh, he's he's going to text Joshua. me the moment he gets in. <laughs> he has to text me. Yeah. <laughs> and Amy, the last time I caught up with you, you were um, you were producing a song for the Lovely Bones, well, a song called Lovely Bones. How's that going? Um, it's going really, really well for me. Um, I have over... 167 that no I think it was 168 thousand hits on YouTube now really? so um it's yeah, the power it's, of social networking it's, isn't it's it? the power of social networking mm. and it's yeah it's still going really well for me and um I've now finished my honours degree so um cool. yeah so I'm more kind of geared to to working more and I've been doing a few gigs around yeah. in the university tents and things like yeah. that so where we can find <laughs> venues right where we can find <laughs> venues so. okay and finally you know um once this with the song, you're actually using social networking to get the message out there, aren't you? That's right. Tell me about that. Yes, um, uh, one of the new criteria for making tracks funding for New Zealand on air is um, getting over 1,000 Facebook likes, which I have achieved, mm -hmm. and also um, <laughs> 500 Twitter followers, which I believe I'm about 20 off achieving. So, okay. um, yeah, I, I will you. have it by the by the by the time it's due. Great. By the, by the time the okay, just quickly, due, what so. uh, what's the Facebook Facebook page, what's that? The Facebook page is facebook.com slash Amy Bowie Music. Okay. So if you go to that page, you'll find links to comment on the song on the Anthem in Black mm -hmm. official um, website. Yep. And uh, you can win some prizes, I okay. believe, from the New Zealand Olympics Committee. Cool. So. And you have actually two CDs to give away today. I do. How would have you like two. to give those away? Should they email me? I think they should email you. Okay. Yes. Kenita at ctv.co.nz. That's Kenita at ctv.co.nz. Or you can give us a call, 377 033. and we'll pop you on the draw for the anthem in black. Amy Bowie and Joshua Goody are so good to have you on the program today. Good luck for your audition Thank in you Auckland. So much. Thank I you. hope it goes well. And good luck with your um, 500 Twitter followers and <laughs> Facebook likes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> good to have you here. Thanks. Now I'd like to welcome Julie Wiley, who is a music specialist in early childhood. Welcome to the program. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Now tell me what you actually do with music and, and young people. Well, I start with very tiny babies um, and the music is the children's language because long before birth they've been listening to the sound of the heartbeat and surrounded with rhythm and hearing the mother's voice. So. We do um, half-hour music sessions for mothers and babies and that involves lap games, beautiful music activities that are designed to build relationship between mother and baby, communication. It's just wonderful. How important is something like this for the, for the, for the mother and the baby? Well, 
I've been involved in a lot of research on music and the brain and they're finding out more and more as time goes on but the music activates every part of the brain and most importantly it calms and regulates um, so if a baby gets highly aroused a lullaby can calm and settle both mother and child mm. and we're finding particularly in my work at the Champion Centre that it has huge significance for children with special needs. Mm. Okay, tell me about this, what you, what you do with the special needs children. Well, I established the programme at the Champion Centre in Music um, 19 years ago. So we work with children with Down syndrome, dyspraxia, um, on a, a range of conditions, autistic spectrum, cerebral palsy. Mm. And what we find is that so many of the children sing their first words. Oh, really? Yes. Instead of speaking? Yes. Them. Gosh. Yes. How old are these um, babies when, um, when they come to your centre? Do they have to be babies or can they be a little bit older than that? Just well, to get into it? in my own music school, um, I've, I'll take one class at the moment, I've got six beautiful little babies and they're all about six and seven months old. Mm. And they know from week to week you see the progress the lap games, the um, rowing, row, row, row your boat and mm. other activities. Mm. They anticipate, but there's a most beautiful circle dance I do with the mothers. And when we all go into the middle, the babies are reaching little hands and feet. And it's just so wonderful to see how they reach out, touch each other. They're chuckling and mm. chortling with joy. Yeah. And someone said to me the other day, it's just so magical as a parent because you come in, especially in these difficult times with the earthquake, and you might be feeling a bit low, but you go away just feeling so uplifted. Mm. And that's what music does, because it's a language of the emotions. Mm. Tell me about the books and the, um, all the CDs that you, you've got here. Well, when I started in with my own music classes 20 years ago, there were only, I think, two or three other music groups and there were very few music resources and the music resources that I did find often didn't have beautiful arrangements and as far as I'm concerned because I've done music therapy training as well as music education to me the arrangements are crucial mm. because a song might be very simple but you want something that maybe has an oboe to paint a story mm. um, like skittery mouse as a clarinet mm. and so music paints the pictures for the child and music I remember all my early memories are music memories and I want to lay that foundation of music for life so the CDs have involved the most wonderful musicians like Judith Bell, Michael Bell, um, Baroque uh, Tom Rainey, who is the head of the jazz school, others like um, Helen Webby, harpist with the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra, Tony Ferner, um, and all these wonderful musicians have come on the journey with me because they know that I'm wanting to have excellence in music experience for children. Mm. And um, the Rockabye Blues CD, I was joined by a professor from Temple University in the States, Beth Bolton, and another um, person from La Trobe University in Melbourne, and they came over to work on that with me. Um, interestingly, a lot of the songs are by children, they've come from the children's world, and one little girl was born at 24 weeks, and she's singing on Rockabye Blues, and it's just such a stunning, stunning little um, arrangement. Um, it, it's a song by Beth Bolton, and she said, but a little girl of three couldn't be on a recording. Well, Little India was the only one who didn't need to have a second take. She was oh, in her gosh. element. Oh, that's gorgeous. OK, and finally, again, what is the importance of um, music with, with babies? Well, music provides regulation, calm. You can sing anything through song. So mothers, um, Louise Shand, who works with me, mm. is now a new mother, mm. and she said she sings everything with Max. She sings all the daily routines. She sings from morning till night, 
and I was listening to her yesterday singing um, and I was talking to her on the telephone and then her husband took over mm. and was singing mm. and this beautiful wee baby chortling with delight <laughs> hearing his dad singing. The other thing is, you know, with the earthquake, um, I, I created an earthquake safety song and it's keeping a whole lot of children calm mm. and regulated in the midst of, you know, all these terrible things. Okay. So to me, it's just about... Um, building the child, mm. building the family, building community. Okay. Julie, how can people get in touch with you? Um, they can go onto my website, www.juliewileymusic.com, okay. and the Facebook, um, okay. and yes, so, right. and all the CDs are available in Good Music, Children's Music. Great. Bookshops. All right, well, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been lovely. Thank you for having me. We'll be back after this break with Warren Feeney. <music> Welcome back to City Life, and we're with Warren Feeney, our arts contributor. Welcome. Hi, Kanita. What's our focus this week? It's back to 183 Milton Street and uh, an exhibition of a year for a sculptor student from the University of Canterbury, Jason Weir. Now I remember 183 Milton Street because I remember something about the fairy lights. Yeah, there were yeah. fairy lights around one of the works and um, I mentioned at the time that I was feeling really, I just, you know, that, that was annoying me because there was, this was a home, it wasn't an art gallery, as a traditional art gallery with white walls and spotlights and that sort of, I guess that kind of rarefied atmosphere where you're looking at the work and the work is really precious and important. Mm. Uh, you know, it's sofas, there's a kitchen, there's a lounge and there are the artworks. And it was interesting going to the opening uh, and looking at another show because it's shifted my thoughts about it. I think it works, I mean, I, I liked the idea initially because it was such a, it was a response to the, uh, to the quake and not having anywhere for someone to exhibit. So, you know, Tim Middleton student had set the space up to run a program until the end of the year. Mm. And it's interesting because going back again and seeing the show, uh, I think one of the things is that you actually, it reminds you that it, it's actually you and the work and the way in which uh, an artwork can establish a conversation with you. And, you know, ultimately it doesn't really matter where it's located. Mm. And, and there's something actually very familiar and, and, and kind of user friendly about a house and a home that isn't always true of an art gallery. Mm. They can be really intimidating. So yeah. I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, I'm really pleased to see the shows running mm. and also to just to kind of have my thoughts about what a gallery could be moved a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Now, he, Jason Weir, he's a sculptor, but yeah. this, this one's about, you know, collaged works on paper. Yeah. I mean, how does this, well, how does this relate? <laughs> well, they, they, well, we'll see that when we have a look at the images. They, they're actually about, they are very much about space, but they're also sort of fantasy images. The show's called uh, Envisions of Earth, and it's a project, basically, he sees them as drawings, so they're drawings that will feed into his sculpture. Okay. And he set himself the task of completing one every day. So he's, they're collage, collage works, so he's using uh, magazines like National Geographic, New Zealand Home and Garden, a whole range of different magazines. Mm. And actually he was saying to me yesterday that, you know, I said, what's it like trying to do this every day? Mm. Because, you know, 365 days a year. And he said, yes, he said, no, get home from university and... Um, I've, I've got to do this collage, but and, but he said it, it's always it's always um, it always tends to be exciting and engaging because he doesn't know what the image is going to be until mm. it's finished, and then some of that will feed into his, his sculptures as well. So if you see the exhibition, there's a small book which has uh, all of the collages, and then there are a number that he's worked on a bigger scale and, and framed those up for exhibition. So so okay. should we have a look at them? Yeah, let's yeah. have a look. Yeah. So these now these are untitled. So. Uh, I was saying that they are about space and spatial relationships. You can see here there's this kind of aerial landscape with this object and metal shape in the foreground and then something that maybe should be in the background. And he talked about them as how all of them, he's interested in foreground, middle, distance, background. Mm. But you can see how this is a photograph, but it's actually not a photograph of something um, recognisable mm. in the sense that, that space has been completely kind of flattened. Mm. So the relationship between foreground and background is confused. Yep. And they're all like that. So they're kind of intriguing and, oh. and interesting. And this one, again, what is this about? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interior of a bedroom and this big metal object, which, in fact, if you look, look at the, um, 
those little, uh, whatever they are above the bed, they've kind of been placed so they're joining onto it. So again, the foreground, the background have been locked into yeah. one another. So th there's this whole history of collage and, and artists in the 1920s, surrealist mm. artists, making, um, using photographs, cut photographs and making surreal images. And it's very much in that tradition, but as a sculptor, I think uh, Jason Weir's more interested in spatial relationships. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, this one again, uh, there's this sort of a relationship between that, that object and the worn surfaces and the background, but it's kind of curiously strange and, and <laughs> odd. Um, this one I really like because the, there's nothing in the foreground for you to relate to uh, a middle distance. Mm. So that large floating object is either very close to the foreground or maybe it's actually a very long way away. You know, it's hard to read the space. Mm. And this one, um, again, is, is sort of... Uh, I think this was an interesting one because of the way all of those the grid shapes and then looking through all of those you've got a different view of parts of that scene and then the picture itself which you know frames it, it, it is also a view of it so one of the things that he did and I don't have images of these but one of the things he's done is that the um, the collaged objects uh, quite often he's cut them at the side so they're not just framed square they've been cut and shaped according to like this interior of a room with so the ceiling comes out further in the picture and they are kind of like sculptural objects. They're not just, he hasn't thought about them as pho just as photographs. He's thought about them as um, sort of physical objects and contained objects too. So, I mean, to me, it looks like the work of a sculptor. And, okay. and I, I think a really good show. Uh, it's only seven or eight works, but certainly, definitely an artist who I'm interested in seeing more work of. Mm. Yeah. Now, would this, um, would this have had a different context or meaning if it had, had been in a traditional gallery space? Um, I think, no. I think that the context of the works themselves, uh, I think those issues that we've just discussed, they would all be there. I think the difference is that there's, a, there's something less precious about the way in which um, you can go into the gallery and view them. So. Mm. I mean, there is a, there's plenty of research to indicate that galleries, for a lot of people, uh, they're intimidating and, and there are social economic groups mm. who feel that they're not for them. Mm. That is, I mean, hard to believe, but they think they're maybe not even allowed into them. Mm. So I think there's something nice about uh, using, this, using the um, domestic uh, environment mm. for, for a show. Of course, you know, I'm saying this, and at the same <laughs> time there's an issue around um, if it's critiquing the art world, here I am as part of the art world, uh, welcoming it and welcoming the <laughs> critique. So, you know, it's a complicated question. Sure is. But what it'll do is it just shifts your thinking about how art's presented, where it belongs in society and, mm. and those sorts of things. And those are always really good and interesting discussions to have. Yeah. yeah. Now, very briefly, you've got, you're got opening some gallery and studio spaces. Yeah. Tell me about those. Yes, we are. We're opening, uh, Ronald Mottram and I, uh, there's a specialist picture frame, we're op opening a gallery at 241 Morehouse Avenue. We've been looking for a space for quite a while now and this came up about five weeks ago, so um, there's a good large gallery space, so we're looking for a request, for, it's for Christchurch artists, and Great. it's very much, it's going to run for 18 months, and it's very much a response to the quake, and giving, a, it's really as close to the central city as, as you can get, mm. uh, right on the border of Morehouse Ave, so yeah. we want to have an ongoing programme. And also, there's also, fortunately, there's six studio spaces for artists. So, Amazing. Yeah. So people can get in touch with you? How's, yeah. How can they do that? Um, if they email me, just warrenfeeney at extra.co.nz. I, I can send out information if they're interested in putting in a, an application for a proposal. Okay. Excellent. Thank yeah. you so much for coming on the programme. I should actually say, in Visions of the Earth, new collages by Jason Weir, 183 Milton Street until the 10th of July. View by appointment 021 236 hope you're writing this down, 021-801-236. Now that is City Life for today. Do you now that you know now that we, you can watch us on demand? Go to ctv.co.nz and click on demand. You can get in touch with us here at City Life. You can email me, kineta at ctv.co.nz. You can give us a call, 3777033, or you can write to us, PO Box 1100 Christchurch. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.